Welcome back to the final film in what somehow became Dark Castle Month. And we'll be ending the way we began with Return to House on Haunted Hill. And we start as we mean to go on, because that's not a goddamn sentence. Fire whoever does your grammar, Dark Castle. And of course, because we're returning to Haunted Hill, we'll be getting another dose of Geoffrey Combs. Does he get any lines this time? Not a fucking one. Before we begin, there's also something odd about this film, as it was straight to DVD and was marketed as a choose-your-own-story movie. As in, at certain points of the movie, you could select different paths the film could take, leading to somewhere close to 96 possible story paths. The whole thing is just a DVD gimmick anyway, I'm just going to go with the basic path because the overall plot isn't affected by it. The film begins with a montage of the asylum and what happened when everyone died, playing over the credits but just enough to know that Dr. Vanicott is bad and the inmates had someone leading the carnage, so they're starting off with some pointless retcon. We then shift to a trendy minimalist apartment as a woman listens to her voicemail, which happens to be from her sister, Sarah, from the last film, and Sarah sounds quite agitated by her sister not calling her back, so her sister does the best thing by going to work instead. Her job involves scantily clad ladies and full-blown tits, which was absolutely necessary and not just to give the audience a good ogle. The next scene is at a college where a professor delivers a lecture on demons, specifically the demon Baphomet and a statue of its likeness. The professor is desperate to find it, but let's not explore his interest any further, since we need more new plot points as the professor is also sleeping with one of his students. Guess it's appropriate his name is Professor Hammer then. Another student bursts in on him to tell him about Sarah, and then her sister gets a call from her mother to say that Sarah is dead via suicide. So yeah, on top of the constant quick-paced plot dumping, they've also decided to kill off the previous film's main character. What happened to Ty Diggs, you may ask? Um, who? Hmm? I think you're mistaken. I mean, a big movie studio wouldn't just forget about one of their previous characters for no reason. That would be the sign of a terrible writer. <laughs> So Sarah's sister, and I assume boyfriend, have gone to her shithole apartment. Why a fucking multi-millionaire like Sarah would live there, I've no clue. But anyway, inside the apartment, they find that she was obsessed with what happened at the house, with the place covered in news articles. Ariel tells the guy that Sarah thought the place was haunted, and then she sees her sister sitting in the chair as she gets her head blown off. You must help them. Ah. So that's how they got around the fact that Ali Lata didn't bother for this film. Mainly because she was busy being in Resident Evil Extinction. Whoa! Now that's Sophie's choice. But with Sarah, just obliterate her face and distort her voice. They could have not done the nonsensical ghost shit that does nothing but get the characters on the main path without much effort. But you know, that's just me. But now it's Ariel's film as she quickly snaps out of it. Hammer appears to tell Ariel that Sarah had the journal of Dr. Vanicott, and within its pages it shows that the statue Hammer's after is in Haunted Hill. Ariel knows Hammer's lying about how Sarah was going to help him find it, as she would never go back. And before they leave, the professor tells her that Vanicott's journal is highly sought after, and there may be other people looking for it. So when Ariel gets home, she conveniently finds that Sarah mailed her Vanicott's journal. She gets a knock at the door as hired goons show up wielding guns, and they're led by this guy who's so smug, he looks like he's just done a particularly noxious fart and no one's noticed. Oh, he also killed Sarah and made it look like suicide, so there's no misunderstanding that he's definitely the bad guy. So quicker than you can say let's get to the point, our bad guys are off to Haunted Hill. And at the house, Professor Hammer and his two students are at the house as well to look for the statue. There's a lot of characters in this film, and the majority of them don't have names. I suspect that's because of the stupid DVD Choose Your Own Adventure gimmick because it gives the film many people to kill off in a variety of different ways and locales without affecting the actual plot. So the film is bloated with characters. But it's alright, that was deliberate. Yeah, I tried to make that sound like a positive in my head, but it's just not, is it? Everyone gets to the main room of the house, and the professor immediately recognises the bad guy, who's a former student of his, but now the competition. This statue belongs in a museum, not in the hands of some private collector. Whoa, someone watched their Indiana Jones box set before writing this script, didn't they? But regardless, the professor asks how the guy found out about the journal, and turns out the student Hammer slept with was also working for the bad guy, because she's a vapid airhead who only cares about lots and lots of cash. 
Whoa, who saw that character shift? Wow, they're really pushing the boat out here with unique and not at all predictable characters. Ariel hears the house beginning to lock down and tells the others what that means because they didn't know about it. Even though the lockdown was one of the most well-known and significant factors to the massacre that happened in the house, did anyone do any kind of research on the place? But our bad guy, who I'm just going to call smug as fuck from now on, is confident that the lockdown won't be a problem, saying they're going to go to the control room first to stop it. Everyone gets into the attic where the machine for the lockdown is, and smug as fuck has a foolproof plan to shut it all down. Why the fuck did that work? Shoot the fuck out of it is not a plan. Either it would do nothing, or just break the machine, causing it to lock down permanently. That was just stupid. So now the lockdown is disabled again, somehow. Smug as fuck is looking at the map of the house, not getting much from it. So Hammer asks to take a look at the map, which results in him getting a punch in the face for no reason. Smug as fuck then suggests they split up to find the statue. You're not seriously suggesting that we all split up in a haunted house, are you? This is what I was talking about when I mentioned in my last review how the self-aware character can be obnoxious. Plus, he can't be that self-aware because he went into the bloody house. But now it's killing time, as everyone has split up. So this is the part of the movie where things just happen in little set pieces, without much cohesion. Firstly, to accommodate the shitty DVD gimmick, but also because the film is terribly written. First, one of the hired goons searches the basement, and his in no way similar to Alien's tracking device tells him he's found the statue. The goon digs through a wall to get at it, and when he goes to tell the others what he's found, the ghosts then reach through the wall, embedding their ghostly hands into his body. He gets a vision of the torture the inmates were subjected to, specifically getting buried in the wall alive by Vanekut. I'd love to know what psychological reason he had for that. And then the guy is killed after being pulled violently through the small gap in the wall. And oh my god, they just totally killed the black guy first. These writers are fucking awful. But moving on, as someone else needs to die quickly, otherwise the audience will get bored, we see another one of the hired goons, the woman this time, enter into an electroshock room, which is where she finds an attractive woman, holding her at gunpoint. But then another one appears, as we see their bare asses, cause why not, and then they get completely naked. Oh, wait for it. Here it comes. There you go. Nudity and lesbianism in the same short minute. What a wonderful childish mentality these writers have. And they're so open about their juvenile mindset. The woman then gets a snog-induced vision of the women being caught mid-tryst by the doctors, who subject them to electric shocks, which is when the woman comes out of the trance to find the women have now become horrible slimy monsters, making her quickly run out of the room and straight into Dr. Vanekut. Who does this? How did that kill her? I mean, obviously there are more things wrong with that death scene, but I think the main one is how did it kill her? And instantly as well. She didn't even bleed, so it wasn't blood loss. You'd think they'd at least get their death scenes right. The others hear the dead woman's gunshot, and smug as fuck radios to find out what's going on. While he does, Ariel gets pulled into a cell, seeing the ghost of one of the inmates, who gives her a vision of him and the other inmates killing Dr. Vanekut. When she comes out of the trance, she finds herself in a straitjacket. Smug as fuck and the others get into the room, finding Ariel, and let her out pretty quickly. So that ghost was just a mild annoyance than anything else, really. Seemed a bit pointless if you ask me. He didn't show her anything she didn't already know, and then he put her in an unlocked room in a straitjacket that was immediately removed. Yes, he's not an evil ghost, but if that's the case, he didn't need to put her in the straitjacket then. Outside the house, a hired goon is with Ariel's boyfriend, and they get told on the radio to come into the house by smug as fuck. And back with Ariel, she tells the others about the good ghost who led the riot against Vanekut. But smug as fuck ignores her, and they continue their search. 
Elsewhere, the self-aware twat and his hired goon are in the main hall looking for the others, when the rustling of some drapes spooks them. The hired goon checks if there's anything there, but then the drapes grab him as we see them being pulled by more ghosts, and eventually the hired goon gets torn to pieces. That was his best take. I mean, he got the screamy face down, but the scream itself was very lackluster if you ask me. That was pretty damn weak. Kyle? You really didn't see that huge blood splatter everywhere? I think Hammer refers to his intelligence as well. Smug as fuck tries to radio the others unaware they're dead, and while they do, the house begins to lock down. Fortunately, Ariel runs for the door, getting out before the entrance closes, but unfortunately, her boyfriend and the hired goon are already inside as smug as fuck asks what he's doing in the house, and that he didn't tell them to come in on the radio. I'm completely surprised that the shoot the fuck out of it plan didn't work on the lockdown mechanism. It was such a flawless plan, they should have been perfectly safe. If there's anything that doesn't make sense in this film, it's that. And of course, outside the house, it's raining profusely. I'm sure that's not to make Ariel's nipples stand out, although they are quite noticeable. But anyway, she's found out that her boyfriend is inside, and the doors then open up for her to return. But nobody in the house notices this at all. Back inside, Smug as fuck is arguing with his hired goon when Ariel comes back to his surprise. And while she tells them about what the house wants, the hired goon walks off distracted by something, as he makes his way down to the basement, finding a creepy nurse. We see the goon wheel down a corridor as everyone's phone starts ringing, which they answer and hear the hired goon screaming. We see what Vanekid is doing to him, which just involves taking his brain out. The ghostly kills in this film are simultaneously more bold, but at the same time less visceral, cause firstly, only two people were killed by ghosts in the first film, knock out in the stupid cloud monster, and those deaths were far more creepy and intense than the ones in this film. Also. We never actually saw Vanekid kill anyone in the first film, whereas here, he's more like a stereotypical slasher killer now. It's completely incongruous to the first film on two different levels. Self-aware twat tries to leave to find an exit, but smug as fuck just points a gun at him, which leads to Ariel pointing a gun at him, and then the floozy pointing a gun at her, so it's a classic Mexican standoff. Hammer tries to defuse the tension, but smug as fuck doesn't like that and tries to shoot Ariel, but others manage to disarm the bad guys and subdue them pretty quickly, so now the good guys, although I use that term very loosely, can work out a way to escape the building, with Ariel finding a possible way out. And Hammer says, rather conveniently, that on the way out, they'll go through the crematorium, which is where Vanekut said the idol will be. But Hammer is going with Ariel to escape, and won't want the statue at all when tempted by it. And while they walk, Hammer gives us a stupid explanation for why Vanekut was such a madman. And as I'm sure you've predicted, it's because the statue makes people go mental. So yeah, the original idea of a sadistic doctor doing horrible things to people for unknown reasons, giving us a glimpse into the evils of mankind and the debauched insanity that we as a species are capable of, is now replaced with a statue did it. That's so much fucking better, isn't it? They all get into the hydrotherapy room, which is just a big tank of water, that's still filled with water after all these years for some reason. They walk through when the lights go screwy, allowing smug as fuck to get free, and drop self-aware twat into the water. Ariel dives in to save him, and they try to escape, but dead bodies start appearing all around them in the water. The bodies suddenly come to life as they try getting out, attacking them. One of them grabs Ariel, giving her another vision of the people who died in the tank, but self-aware twat gets the ghost off her, and is then dragged down into the water to die. Ha! <laughs> I bet you didn't see that coming. <laughs> Smug as fuck, with Floozy having gotten away, tries reading the map, and the Floozy chooses now to say he has no idea what he's doing, mentioning the weird shit going on, but Smug as fuck insists his hired goons are responsible which is when he makes the massive leap in logic that the floozy is in on it too, and points a gun at her, demanding she gets the one who's behind it on the radio. But the floozy runs off while being shot at. She runs into a kitchen hiding from smug as fuck, and then it's more ghostly time as all the furniture levitates to the roof and starts to fall on her. 
She tries to dodge it all but gets knocked to the floor before Vanekit appears with Jeffrey Combs giving us his smuggest I just farted look before dropping a fridge on the woman's head, killing her. Again, pretty damn lacklustre, really. Vanekit didn't even do anything, he just showed up to watch. What happened to the off-screen kills left to be found at intense moments of stress and... Oh wait, subtlety. Sorry, yeah. There's no room for that in this movie. Oh no. The others have made their way to the shower room and the exit Ariel found on the map is nothing more than a small grate blocked by iron bars, so they ain't getting out that way. While looking in the hole, Ariel gets grabbed by another ghost and gets another vision of the lead inmate telling her to destroy the statue, showing her where to find it. And getting out of the trance, she tells the others that if they destroy the statue, it'll get rid of the ghosts, so they go off to the crematorium. Ariel goes to the oven she was shown and crawls inside, without checking if it's safe first. They make their way through, finding a long shaft down to where the statue's hidden, and at the end of the corridor they find a big ominous door, which leads to a room covered in flesh, which looks like something from the ending levels of Half-Life. However, in the centre of the room is the statue, and Hammer is compelled to pick the statue up, causing Ariel to point a gun at him until he's brought out of his trance. Ariel tries shooting it, which seems to be the default plan for this movie, but if they can't destroy it, then their best bet is to remove the statue from the building instead, planning to throw it into the sewer as they break the statue from its pedestal, which of course causes the ghost to go into overdrive. They manage to get out the oven, but are then stopped by smug as fuck demanding the statue, but behind him a load of ghosts have shown up as they grab him and place him in one of the ovens to be cremated. Which is a satisfying death for him, it really was deserved. Firstly because he was a murderer, but also because that amount of smugness needs to be punished. The others run from the crematorium ghosts, but the boyfriend trips and is cornered by the ghosts, telling Ariel to get rid of the statue as he goes back into the secret chamber to escape. In the shower room, Ariel tries to throw the statue down the sewer, but then Hammer goes all golem on her, knocking her down, saying the statue is his precious. The showers then turn on, again, gotta see them nipples, and while Ariel and Hammer struggle, the water turns to blood, in an attempt to make it spookier, but it's more desperate at this point. Hammer starts strangling Ariel as the ghosts and Vanekert stand around watching. However, Ariel gets free and picks up the statue. She gets attacked by Vanekert, who throws her against the wall, but then Hammer's back to normal, to then be killed by Vanekert, bashing his head against the wall. And just after he dies, Ariel manages to throw the statue down the drain. The ghosts chasing her boyfriend disappear, and the other inmate ghosts then proceed to tear Vanekert apart. Hey, what do you know? Jeffrey Combs did have a line after all. And frankly, of all the deaths in this film, they could have done something better than that for Vanekert. He's the big bad of the movie. He deserved to go out in grander fashion than just disintegrating. Give me something, movie. Come on. And the film ends with Ariel and her boyfriend reuniting in the main hall and leaving the house together. But again, this ending will lead to many a murder investigation, I have no doubt. So that was Return to House on Haunted Hill, which is still not a sentence, and that was a very poor sequel to a much better film than this. Return is the worst kind of bad horror film. The first film was bad, but at least it was entertaining. This really has nothing going for it. The plot is all but non-existent, with things just happening with little connection. The tone and atmosphere is completely different to the first film, and the inclusion of the stupid statue as a reason for all the shit that's going on is shitty oversimplification that really didn't need to be added, and was only added to make a goddamn sequel. It's superfluous, cliche as all hell, and just boring, with nothing unique about it. And what the hell happened to the saturation chamber from the first film? That was the standout moment of that film. So that was the end to this exploration into Dark Castle Entertainment. There's been some good, some bad, and some just downright awful. But next week, to counteract all these horror movies we've looked at, we'll be looking at something completely different, with some classic Hong Kong cinema. So until then, see you next time.